Okay, um, the second speaker is Dr. John Hanley. He is Professor of Medicine and Pathology at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, in Canada, and the immediate chair of the SLE Collaborating Clinics, or SLIC. And it's a particular pleasure because Dr. Hanley did a uh, short sabbatical with me many years ago, so thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, and I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for the privilege of presenting here this morning and the opportunity to visit uh, this uh, beautiful venue and the terrific meeting that you've hosted. Uh, this uh, will be a more clinically oriented presentation and hopefully will complement the excellent presentation from Dr. McKay. Um, the, let's see, these are my disclosures. I'm going to start this uh, presentation with just a, a brief diversion. Uh, a few years ago, my wife and I had the privilege of visiting the Piedmonte area of northern Italy. Um, and there is a small town there called Monte Lupo Albese. Pardon my Italian uh, pronunciation. And this was recommended to us uh, as a place to visit because there was a hotel there called Cadalupo, which I believe means home or house of the wolf. And they recommended to us this venue for many reasons, including the spectacular view from each of the uh, hotel rooms. And so we arrived there, and uh, when we checked in, we went straight to the room and looked out the window, and this is what we saw. Um, and you can call this mist or fog or whatever you want to call it, but it doesn't help your, your vision. But of course, this is lupus fog, and the original lupus fog that many of our patients uh, described to us. I'll come back to that later. So what I'd like to do for the next uh, 25 minutes or so is to address uh, three issues. Uh, to look at the totality of neuropsychiatric events in our lupus patients with regards to the range, in particular to try to get to that difficult issue of attribution and outcome. I'll speak very briefly about immunopathogenic mechanisms just as a way of informing treatment strategies. And then I will uh, outline a couple of strategies. Uh, and you'll forgive me if I don't show a whole lot of evidence to support this, because there isn't a lot of uh, robust clinical evidence to support specific treatment strategies. But there are some guidelines that we can, that we can look at. There is a debate uh, amongst medical historians as to who was the first person to recognize nervous system disease in SLE. Uh, the two front runners are Kaposi and, and Osler. But if you go through these reports, they're remarkable for a number of reasons, one of which is that many of the patients with nervous system events had concurrent infection. This is an era, of course, which preceded corticosteroids, and yet infection um, was a very prominent component of the clinical a presentation, uh, and that remains a, an issue of concern today when we see individual patients with lupus and nervous system manifestations. The ACR classification criteria, of course, include seizures and psychosis uh, as features of, uh, of lupus. Uh, the uh, recent work by Michelle Petrie within the SLIC network uh, has expanded that to include other syndromes, mononeuritis multiplex, myelitis, neuropathies, and acute confusional states. But the most comprehensive and, to my mind, helpful classification of nervous system events in lupus uh, is derived from Matt Liang's work when he chaired an ad hoc committee of the, uh, of, of the ACR uh, to develop a standard nomenclature and case definitions for 19 syndromes, 12 of which affect the central nervous system and seven the peripheral nervous system, as shown here. And this, I think, uh, gave us for the first time very clear definitions of what each of these syndromes were. And very helpfully, they also, the work of that group included identifying for each of these 19 syndromes a variety of other possibilities which should be considered when trying to attribute the event to lupus or not. So as you can see, these, thing, th these syndromes include very common manifestations such as headache, rare manifestations such as psychosis. They were never meant to uh, indicate that all of these events were always due to lupus. It was really just a clear definition of what they were with diagnostic guidelines and, and, uh, and guidelines for reporting. But I'll show you how we've used these within the, uh, some of our own studies uh, to develop attribution models. Uh, the, a lot of the work I'm going to show you uh, is derived from the work of the uh, SLIC network uh, which is an international group, but I'm embarrassed and, and, uh, to say that although we have many uh, international sites, none as of yet include South American sites, and I'm hopeful that, that will change in the future. 
in the last 10 to 12 years, the SLIC network having, have uh, recruited to an inception cohort, initially for the study of atherosclerosis, as suggested by Murray Urowitz, but then it was expanded to involve, uh, to study other aspects of the disease, including neuropsychiatric disease. The uh, cohort has now completed its recruitment at over 1,800 patients, some of whom have been followed for uh, 10 years. This gives you an idea of the sorts of patients that are in the cohort. This is the first uh, six, 600 patients that were enrolled. As you can see, it's predominantly female. These are a mean age of, of 35 years, mostly Caucasian, but other racial and ethnic groups are represented. They are close to the time of their diagnosis, just under six months. And you'll see at the bottom of the slide there, if you look just at the enrollment window, which essentially is a 12-month period of time, and apply the ACR classification criteria, approximately 5% of patients will have had a neuropsychiatric event of some sort during that interval. But if you apply the 19 ACR case definitions, that rises to 30%. And common things being common, Headache, mood disorders are highly represented here, but the others are represented as well, as you can see by this pie diagram. Now, one of the first things we did was to try to come up with some simple decision rules for trying to decide which of these uh, syndromes could be attributed to, to lupus or not. And we considered three things which would help us in that regard. One was, when was the onset of the syndrome in relation to the diagnosis of lupus? So if someone had headaches for 30 years and then they developed lupus and continued to have headaches, was it reasonable to consider lupus as a cause of the headaches? I would suggest no. The other factor we looked at were so-called non-SLE factors, and here we went back to the ACR case definitions that Matt Liang and his group uh, developed. And they, for each of the 19 syndromes, listed a number of exclusions or contributors to the event. So exclusions were things like a patient presents with features of meningitis and the lumbar puncture indicates it's a bacterial infection and they have lupus. You're not going to attribute that meningitis or that event uh, to lupus. Whereas a contributor is a weaker link or a potentially weaker contributor. So, for example, a lupus patient presents with psychosis and they're on 40 or 60 milligrams of prednisone. Is prednisone contributing or not? It's difficult to know but you should at least recognize it. And then within these 19 syndromes, as I've mentioned already, there are some that are extremely common in the general population. And using uh, data from a very uh, a small but a very well-designed and conducted study from Finland, uh, we decided that events such as headaches, anxiety, mild depression, mild cognitive impairment, and neuropathy that wasn't confirmed electrophysiologically should never be attributed uh, to lupus. And so we had two attribution models, one more stringent than the other, and they worked simply as this. Model A, the event had to have occurred within the enrollment window, uh, and this, or within the defined period of observation, whether for subsequent follow-up. Um, and that was, for an, at the enrollment window, was about a 12-month period. There could be no non-SLE factors, so no exclusions or associations, as identified and listed in the ACR case definitions, and it could not be one of the so-called ANILA criteria. These were the very common manifestations that you see in the general population. And if those were fulfilled, then the event was attributed to lupus. Model B was less stringent. Uh, building on the work from Arbuckle and colleagues, we recognized that events could occur, neuropsychiatric events could occur prior to the diagnosis of lupus. We extended that window to 10 years prior to the diagnosis of lupus. We said you could not have any, you could not have exclusions from the ACR case definitions, but we would allow an association, but it should not be one of the ANILA criteria, and if that were the case, then the event would be attributed to lupus. And we went back then to the events that were recorded uh, at the uh, enrollment assessment uh, in our inception cohort, you can see that in the top panel, applying the more stringent model A, only 46 of 242 events were attributed to lupus, and in model B, you essentially double this to 93. And now when you re-look uh, the, at the, uh, the pie diagram, you can see that because headaches and anxiety have been taken out, the most common event are seizures followed by cerebral vascular disease and the other manifestations listed uh, around the, uh, the, the, uh, the pie chart. So just to, to be clear about this, uh, what we found using these attribution models that if you just looked at patients, 6 to 12 percent of patients at that enrollment visit had an event that was attributed to lupus, but the majority of events were not attributed to lupus. And if you look at it by events, it's 19 to 38 percent of all events because, of course, almost half of our patients had more than one event within that enrollment window. 
Now, from the perspective of the patient, it doesn't matter all that much. Uh, and this is um, data from the SF36 showing you that for each of the subscales, and this is also true for the summary scores of the SF36, those patients who had events attributed to lupus or not reported a lower quality of life. Um, and this makes sense. If you have a headache, it may not matter whether it's due to lupus or due to migraine. Um, and this is a consistent finding, even when corrected and analyzed in a multivariate way for potential confounders. Uh, this is shown here on a, a cross-sectional basis, but when we looked at a similar study in our own cohort at Dalhousie, and this is looking at the summary scores in the, of the SF36 for the mental component summary scores, you can see that those patients without NP events, which is the red line, had a higher score over an eight-year period compared to those patients who had uh, NP events attributed to lupus or not, and this remains significant even when corrected uh, for other uh, covariates such as disease activity, damage, uh, medications, uh, etc. Using these attribution models, it's also possible uh, to look at a variety of other things, including outcome. So this is data, again, from the SLIC cohort uh, showing the short-term outcome of events uh, attributed to uh, lupus either by model A, model B, or non-lupus. And if you just look at the uh, deep blue uh, uh, column, you'll see that those events which are attributed to lupus are more likely to have resolved over the short period of follow-up. And in fact, this is also true when we extended the follow-up uh, out over uh, a couple of years. So events attributed to lupus from this point of view, and it's a, it's a very simple way of assessing outcome, um, and this is the physician's outcome, not the patient's assessment, indicated that those events attributed to lupus actually did better. And when you look at individual manifestations, uh, it, the same is true at least for some of them. And here's uh, some data published on seizures that uh, was published last year. And you can see that those seizures which were attributed to lupus using model A or model B were more likely uh, to resolve without medication over a period of follow-up, this time extending out over five years, compared to uh, seizures which were attributed to other causes great deal of work, probably the, uh, no other clinical manifestation uh, or event in lupus has been studied more than cognitive function. Um, and this can be done uh, in a variety of ways uh, through formal neuropsychologic assessment using, for example, the ACR test battery, uh, which is a fairly lengthy process for patients and may take up to a day of formal testing. Uh, and in partly because of this, there are more efficient ways, if you will, of assessing um, cognitive function uh, using uh, computer-based systems, and one is the ANAM, or the Automated Neuropsychological Assessment Metrics, which has been used by a variety of investigators, including Michelle Petrie and uh, Robin Bray. Whichever one you use, um, the, you can report your findings either as an assessment of global cognitive function or looking at impairment in individual cognitive domains, as mentioned uh, by Dr. McKay. So here's a summary slide showing that for just about all of the investigators, all of the studies here bar one, um, the global cognitive impairment or global cognitive function uh, was poorer in lupus patients on a cross-sectional basis compared to their controls, whether these were normal or disease controls. But as you can see, the level of normality can vary quite a bit uh, depending on where the bar is set. And the selection of controls is absolutely critical in these studies. Here's uh, some data that we published a couple of years ago using the ANAM, in which we studied three patient groups, lupus patients, rheumatoid arthritis patients, and MS patients, and defined impairment in a, if you like, a stringent and a not so stringent way. So the ANAM will give you information on seven domains of cognitive function in addition to an assessment of psychomotor speed. And if you set the bar pretty low for uh, abnormal, you can see that 50% uh, of, of lupus patients have uh, impairment but a comparable or even higher number of rheumatoid patients and the highest uh, overall degree of impairment was in the MS patients. And if you make that a more stringent definition of impairment, you can see again smaller but comparable numbers in lupus and RA and again the MS patients who are a mild, uh, a mild form of MS, these are MS patients who were ambulatory and not particularly uh, severely affected by the disease, always ha had higher degrees of impairment. So impairment does occur but it's not that frequent and certainly is comparable and sometimes less frequent than in other chronic diseases. And probably uh, something that's uh, worth remembering for every 
one uh, is in the audience is that the, in, in all three groups, age was the strongest predictor of impairment. Looking over time then, uh, this is data from our own cohort where we looked at uh, patients over a five-year period, all of whom underwent formal neuropsychometric assessment at uh, baseline two years later and three years after that. And you can see from a, it was reassuring to us that at least in the way in which we defined abnormal cognitive function, uh, two-thirds of the patients actually were not impaired on any of these assessments. 19% of the patients had resolution of impairment. Only in 9% did, did the impairment emerge. In 4% it fluctuated, and in 4% it persisted in a, in a, in a rather mild, uh, to a rather mild degree. And when you look at individual uh, for, uh, components of cognitive uh, function, here we're looking at change in recent memory over a five-year period. Again, looking at three assessments over that time frame and using the California Verbal Learning Test, you can see that patients who were impaired, as shown on the, uh, in, on the yellow bar, didn't actually deteriorate over time. If anything, when age adjusted, their cognitive function, at least in this assessment, improved. Uh, but there are, of course, patients who do deteriorate, and here you can see that it was the patients in our cohort who had overt uh, nervous system disease, be it seizures, strokes, uh, whatever, as shown again on the yellow bar, they were the ones who actually had at least selective decline in memory, in recent memory uh, in this cohort. So from a, from a clinical perspective, um, we can say that events, uh, nervous system events in lupus patients, they're frequent and very diverse. But at least from the point of view, from using the decision rules that, uh, for attribution that, that we have developed, only a minority of them, uh, either uh, around the beginning of the disease or subsequently, are actually attributable to lupus. But regardless of their attribution, they are associated with a negative impact on patients' quality of life. They can resolve over time, and in fact, events attributed to lupus may have a better outcome with standard of care than, than, patient, than events that are not attributed to lupus. And these observations, I think, have implications both for how we treat patients and also for the study uh, of, of immunopathogenic mechanisms. And I'm just going to show a couple of slides related to pathogenesis. From a clinical perspective, I think there is some value in clustering nervous system events in lupus into those which are focal in nature versus diffuse in nature depending on the neuroanatomical location of the disease. So a focal event could be a stroke. A diffuse event could be acute confusional state. And I've spent the last 15 minutes uh, trying to persuade you that a lot of these events that occur in our lupus patients are, in fact, not directly attributed to lupus. But there are a variety of mechanisms, uh, immunopathogenic mechanisms, which do account uh, for uh, some of these focal and diffuse NP events. And these can be clustered under vasculopathy, and it's primarily a microvasculopathy. A variety of autoantibodies, which we've uh, heard about uh, already this morning, uh, and inflammatory mediators. And, and these, to varying degrees, will contribute uh, to either focal or diffuse uh, disease. And certainly at this meeting we've seen some very exciting data from uh, Dr. Gonzalez's lab in Santiago, uh, extending what we already know about the antiribosomal P story and uh, providing a, a very nice potential mechanism for how these antibodies can induce nervous system disease. The, uh, what I want to uh, spend a, just a couple of slides on is looking at the final mechanism there, the inflammatory mediators. So there are a lot of studies reporting elevated levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines in cerebrospinal fluid from patients with neuropsychiatric uh, disease. These can be uh, derived either from neuronal or, or glial cells. And I think we now have some evidence uh, that the regulation or the production of these cytokines may in fact be under autoantibody regulation in, in nervous system lupus. So here's data from Dr. Elkan's lab, published a couple of years ago, in which he looked at the ability of CSF or IgG from the CSF of lupus patients and compared it to IgG from the serum of the same lupus patients to induce the production of interferon alpha in a responder system. And you can see the vertical axis is on a log scale, but there are dramatic differences between the potent of IgG from the CSF versus the potency of IgG isolated from the serum of the same patients to induce this uh, response, giving us, I think, a very nice link uh, between the autoantibodies, uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, and the uh, clinical events. So drawing on this, I would suggest to you that we have two 
broad pathogen, pathogenic mechanisms uh, for explaining those nervous system events which we attribute to lupus. The first one is vascular, in which the mediators are antiphospholipid antibodies, possibly immune complexes. And these induce uh, thrombosis or a microangiopathy. And we see this in the clinic uh, or in our hospitalized patients predominantly as either focal events such as stroke or diffuse events such as cognitive uh, dysfunction. A number of groups have reported that persistence of high levels of antiphospholipid antibodies is associated with cognitive decline over time, irrespective of whether there are clinically overt events. David Eisenberg's group, our group, and others have, have reported this. The other uh, autoimmune pathogenic mechanism is in more inflammatory in nature. And here the players are autoantibodies, cytokines, chemokines, possibly uh, MM, uh, matrix metalloproteinases, uh, which may be uh, a mediator of uh, permeabilizing the blood-brain barrier because permeabilization of the blood-brain barrier is critical if the antibodies are to pass from the circulation into the CSF and access neuronal tissue, where they may form immune complexes and lead to activation of plasma cytoid dendritic cells and the production of alpha interferon and other pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then this is seen in the clinic uh, with diffuse neuropsychiatric events such as psychosis or acute confusional states, which is more common. Uh, using this, and this is just a component and a very uh, preliminary evidence to support this, again, work uh, coming from the inception cohort within SLIC, we looked at whether or not the presence of antiribosomal P antibodies at enrollment would predict uh, or be associated with the uh, subsequent development of, of a psychotic state. And you can see that the hazard ratio is almost four. But of course, the number of patients affected is quite small. So the sensitivity of this test makes it difficult to use from a clinical perspective. And on the other panel, you can see the presence of a lupus anticoagulant at enrollment was associated with subsequent intracranial thrombosis. But again, the sensitivity of this test, even though the hazard ratio is quite reasonable, the sensitivity is, is poor. So, to conclude, from a pathogenetic point of view, there, are, there is evidence to support distinct autoimmune uh, inflammatory pathogenetic mechanisms which can be linked to uh, different types of uh, clinical nervous system events. There is a problem with this low sensitivity of current serological tests, which certainly limits their application in individual cases. But there are other ways of looking at this, and, and, and these are the studies that yet need to be done, where we look at either the persistence of the autoantibody, uh, the change in level of the autoantibody, or linking it to some biomarker of a blood-brain barrier permeability, uh, which I think could help and enhance the clinical utility uh, of this approach from an investigative point of view. And I think we do have enough evidence to at least outline a couple of different strategies for the treatment of, of nervous system events in lupus. So in the remaining few slides, I'm just going to give you um, a personal approach uh, to this. Um, and the first point is that I think if you're asked to see a patient with a nervous system event and the question on the consult is, is this related to lupus, I always start by saying, well, does the patient have lupus? And you may think I'm being facetious, but I'm sure you've all had the experience where somebody has a seizure and a positive ANA and uh, everybody wants to say they have CNS lupus. So I always say, does the patient have lupus? I think uh, even in clinical care, regardless of, of what we do in studies, you, you, you still have to try to address the issue of attribution uh, and try to come to some decision as to whether or not you think the event is due to lupus and whether or not it's due to ongoing active lupus in that patient or a consequence of damage because the approach to therapy is going to be different. Um, and it's important to recognize that, of course, in clinical practice, there may be both lupus-specific and non-lupus-related uh, contributors to that nervous system event. And these are decisions which have to be made to a large extent on a clinical basis, but there are a variety of diagnostic tools which can be used. So we've heard a lot about autoantibodies uh, this morning and, and throughout the meeting. Uh, CSF is um, terrific uh, from an investigative point of view, but from a clinical point of view, uh, the main reason for drawing CSF is to exclude infection. However, if you have CSF, and you, you're going to discard it, please send it to me, and I promise you I'll put you in my will. Uh, but if you have CSF from patients uh, like this, you can uh, do a number of very uh, important things from, from a research perspective. Um, electrophysiological assessment will be helpful, obviously, in seizure disorders or peripheral nervous system disease. Neuropsychological assessment, I think, should only be done if there is a concern about cognitive impairment. I don't 
personally advocate doing neuropsychological assessment on every lupus patient. Uh, but if there's a concern, uh, either from the, uh, the, the patient or the physician, then I think it is a helpful thing to do. And apologies to the neuroimagers in the audience. Because of time, I did not uh, include this in my presentation today, but there are a variety of ways in which one can assess either brain structure or brain function. And then, um, with, with these various investigative tools, uh, you can consider your treatment strategy. The first thing is to think of those contributors which are non-lupus related. We're all, we've been told repeatedly and appropriately that hypertension is not good for the kidneys. Well, hypertension is not good for the brain either. So if a patient is hypertensive, um, it should be treated. And obviously infection, other metabolic abnormalities, lifestyle modification if the cognitive deficits are subtle and possibly related uh, to a, a stressful work environment. So think of those things before you get into specific therapies. Bear in mind as well that symptomatic therapies work just as well in lupus patients as they do in non-lupus patients. And so antidepressants, anticonvulsants, etc., are helpful. And then when you think of the more uh, specific therapies, I think you, it's helpful to consider whether this is a focal event in which anticoagulation is going to be uh, the major uh, strategy, whereas if it's a diffuse event, it's going to be, you're going to rely more on uh, anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory therapies. Now, the evidence for these, using these latter two, is not particularly strong, but I'll just show you uh, a little bit. So, when it comes to the treatment of a procoagulant state, there are no s studies that have looked at this specifically in the context of nervous system lupus, at least that I'm aware of, uh, in a controlled fashion. But of course, there are studies looking at peripheral venous thrombosis. This is a study uh, from Canada, uh, published a number of years ago, in which uh, the conclusion was that there was no difference between high-intensity and low-intensity anticoagulation for the prevention of recurrent thrombosis uh, in patients with antiphospholipid syndrome, regardless of whether or not they had lupus. However, this is... Uh, the majority of these patients did not have arterial disease, and this remains a controversial issue. And this is a very nice meta-analysis showing that a more aggressive form uh, of anticoagulation does result in fewer recurrent thrombotic events. And this may be particularly important in the context of arterial disease. But of course, that does come with a higher risk of complications. Um, but it is certainly something that, that's worth considering. From the, the treatment of the inflammatory uh, type uh, pathogenetic mechanism giving you diffuse manifestations, there are a whole host of uncontrolled studies supporting the use of high-dose corticosteroids, uh, potent immunosuppression, even in the form of uh, cyclophosphamide. And I'll just show you one study uh, from uh, Mexico, published a number of years ago now, but it's one of the few, very few controlled studies addressing this issue. So these were just 32 patients, all with severe neurological disease, Patients with psychiatric disease and antiphospholipid syndrome were specifically excluded, and they were treated either with high-dose corticosteroids or corticosteroids plus cyclophosphamide in a pretty intensive regime, and they had predefined response criteria. Um, most patients, given that uh, degree of aggressive therapy, did well, but those patients who received cyclophosphamide did better than those treated with metalprednisone alone. So there is some evidence that we should consider this uh, aggressive therapy in the treatment of severe neurological disease. So to summarize, um, nervous system disease in lupus uh, is common uh, and consists of very common types of events such as headache to rare events. I think the ACR case definitions are helpful and provide us a very useful platform both from the point of view of doing clinical studies but also in guiding uh, decisions at the bedside and in the clinic about individual patients. The attribution of the events, at least from our perspective in SLIC, indicates that the majority of the events overall are not actually attributed to lupus, but those which are have a multifactorial uh, etiology, which includes autoantibodies, inflammatory mediators, and this gives rise to two uh, complementary but separate immunopathogenic mechanisms, vascular and inflammatory. We have ways of measuring responses and clinical outcomes in this manifestation of lupus. And so we are able to do studies um, and to assess our individual patients. And don't forget that the treatment options include uh, symptom control, immunosuppression, anticoagulation, and we recognize, of course, that we are badly in need of appropriately controlled studies. I'd like to acknowledge a number of people who have helped me with uh, some of this work over many years, uh, in particular the uh, colleagues in the SLIC network and my own colleagues in, at Dalhousie and, of course, the funding um, in, 
institution or the funding uh, bodies as well. Just to return briefly to um, Montelupo Albese, uh, this was where uh, my wife and I checked in and saw this beautiful view, but uh, we went to bed, had a good night's sleep, and the following morning looked out and there it was. So I think uh, CNS lupus is not quite as clear as this yet, but the mist is beginning uh, to lift, and certainly looking back over the progress that's been made and the presentations and the science that's been uh, presented at, at these meetings over the last couple of decades, I see tremendous uh, progress and, and reasons for optimism. <coughs> and I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you.